Summer in the City is a festival to support Voices of Our City Choir and its work with San Diego's homeless and unsheltered residents. The festival will feature popular San Diego bands and entertainers, including the Voices of Our City Choir. With food and drinks available on site, there will be something for everyone. The festival is Sunday, August 18th from 4 to 9 p.m. in downtown San Diego. Visit voicesofourcity.org for details. Well, this is nice to have the gruesome threesome back. All right, three, two. Thanks for joining us on the Voice of San Diego podcast in partnership with News Radio 600 Kogo. I'm Scott Lewis, the editor in chief at Voice. I'm joined by Sarah Libby, our managing editor. Hello. How are you? Great. And rejoining us this week, Andrew Keats, Lord Baltimore of Golden Hill. Welcome back. Hey, how are you? Good. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Coming up on the show today, there was a lot of interest in campaign fundraising news this week. We brought in Republican consultant Mason Heron, who tracked the numbers closely, helped us visualize them, and he's been following a couple of those races really closely, has some insight. We enjoyed talking with him. Also, teachers at another renowned charter school have formed a union. We talked to Voice of San Diego reporter Ashley McGlone. Yes, Ashley McGlone is back. She talked to them about what kind of contract they're aiming for, and it won't be exactly like, like what traditional teachers have. And thousands of new homes are now expected on Morena Boulevard. That's following a vote by the San Diego City Council last week. It's a big deal. We're going to talk about that. But first... Yeah, so I have a baseball question that I feel that you two are uniquely suited to answer. Yeah. As you know, I don't follow baseball closely, but I follow you guys, Mm -hmm. follow the news. I've absorbed two facts about Fernando Tatis Jr. Okay. One is that he's good at baseball. Understatement, but yes. Okay. Fair enough. The other is that he's a tiny baby, an infant, who has somehow miraculously succeeded in baseball. (laughs) Yes. Why is every single post about him, this kid is fast, (laughs) he's only 20, but he's doing great things. Can you believe he's 20 years and 217 (laughs) days old? Like, it's been a while since... LeBron, for example, yeah. went to the NBA right out of high school, but yeah. I really don't remember him or like when Juju Smith-Schuster catches a touchdown being like, this tiny embryo has <laughs> succeeded in sport. Okay. Yeah, we still I, measure Tatis's age in months, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's what> he's, <laughs> like he's in a size five diaper and he hit his okay. 12th home run. I have, let's structure our answer in two parts. I, Andy? I have no response. <laughs> no, I, no yeah. Andy has a, will have a technical response. Let me go I, with I a, a general response. One is his his nickname, or first of all, he's the son of a professional baseball player who did really well. So he's okay. a, he, is, he is a junior. He's literally a junior. His his chosen and embraced nickname is El Nino. Okay, that explains a lot. So Got he, it. he's he's leaned all the way into that. Okay. He also calls himself and is referred to often as Bebo, uh, which is close. And he's uh, he's just he's really embraced this idea of like the or they have embraced this idea that there's young kids coming up through the system and they're now here. But now that you say it the way that you say it, it makes me feel yeah. weird. So I mean, aren't all professional athletes in their early twenties? It's, it's like the Tom well, Brady's of the world who are weird. Well, this like, is my it's not this is weird the part that this guy is twenty. Well, this is the part I wanted to turn to Andy to because it it is a little weird for somebody that young to do this well right away. I would yeah, like I'll to just suggest that it's not. Well, he like I won't pull them all up, but he ha- is setting a bunch of records at like first person to do x in x number of games so he or before x age so he is quite literally setting all-time records for accomplishment at a young age if that I helps understand. at all. But I just want you you're all also to know right that, that from an outside perspective, yeah. the fact that a 20-year-old man is playing a professional sport is not weird. Fair enough. Yes. I, He's I, like I, seven years older than a typical like female Olympic gymnast. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, the only thing I can lean on is El Nino. He's gone hard into that. That is an explanation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
I knew you guys would know. Thank you. Yeah. I do still feel a little weird. Might not (laughs) lean into that so much. (laughs) Yeah. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. All right. So we wanted to talk about another old friend. So I think Carl DeMaio, radio talk show host, former city councilman, Carl DeMaio, really, really made art out of self-promotion this last week. I, it's, I and others really work hard at self-promotion, but this is, this is something. He's not working. This is like, it's just so natural. It's, it's instinctual. It's like, yeah. So he he set it up, him and his staff, that he wanted to really build up tension for his decision about whether he wanted to run for Congress or not, and set out a bunch of like, I'm going to make my decision in a few days. Very LeBron-esque, yeah, right? Set the stage for this big decision moment. Uh, and he tried to heighten the tension for it. He said, uh, you know, I'm just, the people are clamoring for me to run for this seat. He said, quote, at the same time, DeMaio, I'm sorry, he didn't say this. The release from his team said this. At the same time, DeMaio does not need to run for Congress to advance (laughs) policy ideas as he currently hosts the popular DeMaio Report weekdays, 3 to 6 p.m. on News Radio 600 Kogo. And he serves as chairman of Reform California. Just a real, just drop of art. Yeah, it's good. It's just, just art. The polling, he said, shows Democrats could flip the seat if I don't run. So back in first person here, we simply cannot lose another seat in California to the Democrats. Uh, he's 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 the martyr. He's the the populist. There's actually a great deal of self sacrifice here because on account of this News Radio 600 Kogo show, and as his role as chairman of Reform California. <laughs> So despite the the clamoring, he must do this. Yeah, and uh, he's there, the only one. In yeah, fact, yeah. he is the he is the man. So you asked him. Real martyrdom. He actually doesn't live in the district. It's not a requirement. Right. People might not realize that to run for Congress, you don't have to live in the district. Uh, yes, his spokesman said not an issue. You know, he's wildly popular, and and people are demanding his presence in the race. You know, I was thinking about this. Uh, if Daryl Issa gets in the race, uh, which is rumored, but no one knows for sure where he's going to land. Uh, we would have people who have run for or represented three different congressional districts oh, in right. San Diego in the same race. Right. Brian Jones is mentioned as running as well, potentially. Yes. Sam Abed, former mayor of Escondido, is That's mentioned right. as or he's in. Yeah. Bill Wells, the mayor of El Cajon. Uh, Larry Wilski, another Republican, former Navy SEAL. And uh, now, and then, of course, the Democrat, Amar Kampa Najjar, who has raised more money than all of them combined. Uh, so, we're going to talk about some fundraising issues and the race coming up later with Mason Heron. Um, anyway, if you want a course on self promotion, check this last week out. Fascinating. Of silence. No charter school has been held up as an example of the power of reform, of education reform in San Diego, maybe anywhere, as much as Gompers Prep. That's the uh, sort of 6th to 12th grade school in southeastern San Diego. It was once seen as unsafe. There's all these stories about suspensions, about how much of an embarrassment was. Teachers and the principal broke away from the district in a big story in the early 2000s. Uh, partnered up with UC San Diego, and it became known for its signature uniforms, its discipline, its ability in particular to get graduates into into college, which uh, also got some scrutiny later. Reporter Ashley McGlone, she is back. Ashley McGlone is back. She checked in with the school because it is now starting a new chapter, uh, this one with a teacher's union. So, Ashley, welcome. Hello. Hello there. So you checked in. What was your main takeaway from all the people you talked to about this uh, unionization effort? 
You know, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting was there was not a disagreement among the union organizers or union detractors uh, that things have been a bit tense in recent months since the union was formed and organized last fall. Um, You know, the director used to be able to just make changes sort of as desire to the calendar or, um, you know, various work conditions. And now instead, he's already begun receiving cease and desist letters from the newly formed union saying, hey, 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 wait, you need to bargain those things. Um, And that's caused some tension on campus. You know, some teachers that uh, are not supportive of the union, you know, uh, are not in agreement with uh, other teachers who did support the union. Um, Not every teacher was asked if they supported the union, although the signatures that were gathered, they did gather 80 percent in support. Um, But, yeah, there's also some parents that are upset and alleging that teachers are inappropriately uh, including students in sort of the union politics. So that's been a little bit uh, unwelcome, Um, although the union organizers say they're not aware of anyone being disciplined for doing that. Um, But the one thing that sort of was a difference was. Uh, those that were sort of against the union said that the campus was just fine before the union. It was sort of a family. And now that's been diminished. Uh, whereas the teachers in support of the union who organized this said, well, before, no, it, it wasn't so rosy and we didn't feel comfortable speaking up and we don't feel like we had a meaningful say or we were afraid to have a, a meaningful say and speak up about things we had concerns about or wanted to change because we are at will employees and we didn't want to lose our jobs. So um, there was a difference there that I thought was interesting. I have a very important question, and that is because this is a story about a school and unions in particular, are there any homemade T-shirts involved? (laughs) There are. There are homemade T-shirts. A a couple of parents, uh, Victor and Teresa Gonzalez, I believe, uh, had made some shirts. Again, they they, they say that the teachers were sort of sharing sob stories with students about how they can't pay their bills because they aren't paid enough. Um, and Gompers teachers on average, they are, um, you know, less further along in their careers and they do make on average quite a bit less than the average San Diego Unified teacher. Um, but they say, hey, teachers, we don't want you talking to our students about any of this. We don't want our kids involved. They're minors. So they made some shirts uh, to that effect. And I understand they've worn them to various Gompers board meetings, uh, expressing frustration at uh, the addition of the union and the discussion with their children. So unionization is not easy, though. It's not an easy process. Would it be fair to say that whatever disagreements there were, just the fact that the unionization effort has been successful serves as evidence that people wanted this and that there was some sort of cause for it and that clearly things weren't okay? Right. So, yeah. So the union organizers, again, who are teachers on campus say, yeah, they got 80 percent of people, teachers on campus to support it. Um, so absolutely. They, they say, you know, the majority weren't uh, they see room for improvement. They see uh, a need for change. One of the topics I believe that was brought up in the fall specifically was that Gompers teachers are required to teach summer school. That's sort of a part of their commitment for the year. So they have a longer school year uh, than the normal San Diego Unified Public School. It's something like 205 days instead of 184 days. They want to change that. They want extra pay if they're going to do the summer school. And so that was something I understand was of interest to a, a, a large swath of the teachers there. So there was there's another uh, much renowned charter school in San Diego, Preuss, which is also affiliated with UC San Diego. It also saw its teachers unionize. And in that union effort, there was some unique provisions. Uh, so it's a union, but they also didn't have the same sort of um, uh, decisions and, and, and structure as San Diego Unified's traditional teachers. They also told you at Gompers that they wanted to try to uh, make it unique, uh, preserve what was sort of unique about Gompers. Uh, how did they say they'll do that? So, yeah, so on some specific things that they're seeking, you know, will be more closely mirroring what a teacher at a traditional public school has. So like the salary schedule, they want more increases for longevity and and they don't really agree that the merit pay system that they have now uh, is working for everybody. They you know, That's only really working for a handful and they want to see that change. But as far as, um, you know, being at will employees, they, they want to do away with that. Uh, but uh, Asusena Garcia, who's one of the organizers, said, you know, tenure is not really the same thing as what they want to see brought in, which is what you would see at a normal school, a normal public school. Um, they want to preserve some flexibility for administrators to let teachers go, even if they've been there for 5, 10, 15 years, if they can prove that they're not meeting expectations via 
you know, the evaluation system that's put in place. Uh, so that would be a, a marked difference than, uh, again, your normal public school, which has a very hard time dismissing teachers, uh, even in, in very difficult, you know, proven misconduct cases after they've been employed for a couple of years. Well, Ashley McGlone, it is so glad, uh, good to have you back from your creation of a human break. Really excited <laughs> to have you. So, so thanks and great work. Thanks. All right, All right, Ashley, y'all. Thank you. All right, thanks, thanks Ashley. Ashley. Good chatting. All right, bye. bye. Okay, last week, the San Diego City Council unanimously approved the Morena Corridor Plan. They have now rezoned, er, rezoned areas along Morena Boulevard to allow for thousands of new homes near the new trolley stations that are coming to that area. Andrew Keats, you previewed this decision. Uh, did you ever expect it would be unanimous? No, I did not. I simply did not. No. So, so uh, there was so the t- two people who seem to have the most concerns about it, Barbara Bree and uh, the city councilwoman for the coastal areas, Jen Campbell. Uh, she they were uh, concerned about, but they came aboard after some changes were made to the plan for the streets. Right? What what happened with that? Yeah, so they made a couple changes in the from what the city had put forward. First, they attempted to well, not they. Jen Campbell made a motion um, to vote for lowering the height limit so that there would not be the um, relatively significant height increase near the transit stations. That failed. That did not get through. Um, so then she made another motion, which was uh, changes on the street and changes for the low income housing requirements um so the morena boulevard is four lanes right now and the city had proposed taking it down to three lanes and building a a nice wide cycle track along it along with an extended sidewalk area and they took that out and kept it at four lanes there will still be some protected bike lanes there but they'll be um smaller Basically, yeah. and not like protected by a curb, but protected by those bollards, bollards right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and the so the height. Let me explain this. So around the Tecolote station, where the Jeromes and Toys R Us, yeah, yeah, uh, used to be or will be replaced there. There's actually going to be some towers there of about ten stories or something. Or yeah, nine. up to up to a hundred feet if mm-hmm. a developer took advantage of all the available like density bonus and all that stuff. But at Claremont, is it a hundred feet as well? No, it's no no change whatsoever was made at Claremont. Oh, okay. So they. So to take people back in time, when this first was proposed, the initial controversy was actually actually focused around the Claremont Drive station mm-hmm. area. Um, the city's response to that was to just say, okay, forget it. We're not going to make any changes at all to the Claremont Drive station. So they only made changes at the Tecolote, the new light rail station at, the, the, at Tecolote Drive. The Claremont Drive may ha- incur some changes, but they punted that decision until uh, the city adopts a new community plan for the entire Claremont area. The Tecolote station is technically in Linda Vista, so they said, we're going to make this change now, but we will make no change whatsoever at Claremont. So that still has a 30-foot height limit. But uh, but they did increase the number of homes that could be around that Claremont they station? They made no changes at all of at any all. kind, 0.0 changes at all. Oh, okay. So that's Claremont why Drive, it, no changes at all. So that's why it passed unanimously, because yeah. Tecolote wasn't as big a deal. Fair, yes. Okay, fair enough. All right, so uh, the world did not end. Right. Now, I should say that there's a third station in that area up Mm -hmm. at Balboa Balboa Drive. Um, So the Balboa Drive station is also in Claremont. So on the Claremont side of that station, they also made no changes. But in Pacific Beach, which is just right on the other side of the freeway there, which is technically within like the transit priority area distance from the station they made changes there so they increased you could build up to like three thousand new homes in pb next next to the balboa station and six thousand new homes in linda vista next to the tecolote station and they completely punted any decision whatsoever on the claremont drive station okay got it got it all right well so that's uh, a fascinating thing and all and just to be clear toys r us is gone yeah homes are common yeah that's right. All right.
On the other side of the break, Sarah and I talk with Mason Heron. He's a political consultant. He's got some analysis on the biggest races we are watching for 2020. And all the money that was collected there is a lot of interest in that as people try to understand who's where with all these races. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this Voice of San Diego podcast. If you like what you hear and want more news like this, sign up for The Morning Report. That's our most popular newsletter. We send it out every weekday. Just visit voiceofsandiego.org and click on the newsletter tab. And thanks. We are back. This week, Sarah and I sat down with Mason Heron. He's a political consultant from Edgewater Strategies. If you have not seen it yet, Mason's work was featured in our most recent politics report. There's a link for that in the show notes. And if you enjoy this interview, then you should really make the politics report a part of your life, a really close part, intimate part of your life. Saturday mornings, coffee, politics report. Mason did a great job breaking down the city and county races and the money each candidate has right now. So Sarah and I sat down with Mason to hash it all out. We talked about the city council, county supervisor races, the congressional race in the 50th district, and more. Enjoy. All right. So what stood out for you with uh, these local races? We we pulled together districts uh, for this county supervisor races. We're going to be following, in particular, District 3 uh, there are a lot, but there's big races in District 2 and District 1. Uh, the term limits have made it so that people are now running for these seats, uh, and they're interesting, and they're as important as they should be. And then the city council, the mayor's race, city attorney's race. What kind of trends or, or things really stood out? My sense is that there's a lot of competitive competitiveness out there, um, especially in some of these crowded races. A lot of times, I, I feel like in the past, you'd see someone really start to pull away and consolidate a lot better. There's a little bit of that. You know, Noe Zosa was able to pull that off to a certain extent. Uh, you know, he, him... Him have the luxury of being the only Republican in that race, I think, helps, um, and especially considering that's a that's a swing seat. Um, We're talking about District 7, so this is correct. the Tierra Santa era, San Carlos. Uh, current incumbent uh, Scott Sherman is termed out. Uh, there's a bunch of Repub- uh, Democrats running, and then Nolizosa is the only Republican, and, and he raised more money than... All of the candidates for city races, yes. for city council races. Yes, correct. There was a couple newcomers who I was pretty impressed by uh, in that same race, Rule Campillo. Um, I know he's 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 got some roots in town, but hasn't really been on the political scene. So for him to raise the amount that he did uh, without, you know, he actually didn't spend a whole lot either. So he's going to be in a pretty good position as well. Yeah, he's a, he's a, a deputy city attorney um, running for council in that seat too. Yeah. And I think Rafael Castellanos, his numbers popped out as well. You know, he's going against someone, Ben Hueso, who's an incumbent state senator. He's been elected in that area a while. He's got a lot of different relationships. Uh, but I think Rafael just worked it. And, you know, in, in some of these races, too, you know, there's there's 400 ways to present numbers. And inevitably, I hear from campaigns saying, well, why didn't you show this or why didn't you show this? And at the end of the day, I just try to be a you know, copy, copy and paste monkey. Let me provide just some context on that. So you mentioned Rafael Castellanos. He's the a port commissioner running in District 1, the South Bay County Supervisor seat. And he's running against Ben Wieso, as you said, but also Nora Vargas, yes. who's a, a vice president at Planned Parenthood. And there's a that's a big, intense rivalry it's not getting as much attention as District Three, right? And and Nora had good numbers as well. And she's you know she's an incumbent, but on a on a school board, so it's a little bit different. But mm-hmm. it was for all three of them. You know they didn't make it any easier to try to figure out who exactly the front runner is in that race. I think one of the things too is that in some of these races, and you know it takes forever to figure this out, but they basically take the primary money and the general money and lump it together in one pile. Problem is though, people can raise for both the primary and the general, but you can only spend primary money in the primary. So enterprising candidates and campaigns will point out that, hey, not only do I have a lot of money, but I have way more money I can spend in the primary in them. And uh, Raphael's campaign was one of that did that and pointed that out. So he's even he's got a lot of primary money relative to the other two. So that's even more, more interesting and impressive um, for a, a number of reasons. You mentioned uh, candidates whose numbers stood out. Is there any sort of minimum or baseline that you look at and say, oh, they didn't raise... 20 grand, that's not good. It really depends on the race. And I think, too, there's one thing, you know, it's one thing to raise the money, but I also look at, okay, are they, how, what's their burn rate, right? Are they, are they dishing out 10% of their funds every month to pay people on staff? And that's a month, that's something that's probably going to increase over time as you get closer. So it, yeah, it really depends on the race. Um, I'd say for city council races, you know, if they're, if they're sitting here with their cash on hand, sands the debt and everything like that, if there's, if they're sitting there with, 
40 they're in the game again Mm -hmm. relative to their opponents and things like that i think also too in some of these races like you know the mayor's race uh probably the district three race people get really focused in on what the candidates have raised and are doing but in a lot of these races you know the outside groups come next year they're going to potentially be more funding providing more financial resources to the campaigns and the actual campaigns themselves so some people fall into the trap where you know, one maybe one candidate raised 38, one raised 34, and the other one raised 30. And they say, well, 38's in the front runner. But in that, on those margins, it's just so difficult. One of the things you did that I really, really appreciated is often these stories come out and it's like, this person raised this much and this person raised this much. And you mentioned before, what's most important is how much they actually have to spend and deploy in these races. And so you took that one step further. Sometimes we do just cash on hand, but then you took and created a column that was really helpful that we turned into graphs, which was cash on hand minus their already promised debts, which is probably a, an important subject for you as a campaign consultant sometimes because those debts are for people like you, right? Like, right, exactly. And and They're important. You, They're really important. Yeah, you yeah. can't just uh, wipe those away. Those aren't just things that go away. Those right. are those are real, and it's illegal not to pay them, right? right. And the, the, the slight exception to that is a lot of times candidates will loan themselves money um, right. in order to bolster their total contributions number, but that turns into debt as well. Sometimes they end up in the crunch time of the race, they end up spending it, but sometimes they try to strategically say, okay, I'm just putting this in now, but I'm going to, you know, kind of back raise fund into it and pull it out later. So it kind of depends on the race and the campaign, but that's another thing to take into consideration as well. So one thing that really struck me this time around was the number of campaign messages sent out by various candidates kind of touting uh, things about their own fundraising numbers and kind of attacking aspects of their opponent's fundraising numbers. So I saw people pointing out things like, oh, all of their donors are from Sacramento or live outside the district, or I have a really high number of donors, you know, which presumably says something. Do you think that those kinds of appeals or messages resonate with donors? I, it just stuck struck me as something that was like really far removed from something that a voter would care about. What's your take on yeah, that? Yeah, that you might have another consultant here that disagrees with me, but I don't think I think consultants go in at the beginning of the day thinking it'll matter with voters, but I never I rarely see it actually advertised to voters. And when it does, it doesn't seem they don't seem to care a whole lot. I mean, unless it's completely egregious, they might. But I think donors think that voters care. So that's why during these early days, the spin machine ramps up. And and also, too, especially when candidates are behind, they try to look for anything that they can grasp onto in order to present their numbers in a more favorable light. Mm -hmm. Um, So you'll see all sorts of, you know, it could get really desperate where they do random math trick, not tricks, but just random math equations that only they would find in order to present themselves a little bit more favorably. Yeah. Let's ask about a couple of races in particular. So this week... uh, Carl DeMaio, talk show host, former city councilman, uh, made a bid for the congressional seat that is now occupied by Duncan Hunter, beleaguered Duncan Hunter. He It's the 50th congressional district. It is, the I think, the most conservative as far as voting patterns go for the entire state. Uh, he jumped in basically with this message that I, I'm the only one who can save this very important district for Republicans. And if I do, it'll signal what, you know, we can do to retake California. I took a little bit of issue with that. Like if, if Republicans protect their only <laughs> the most like conservative seat, doesn't seem like that's the like an indicator of too much more than they were able to protect that seat. He jumped in, um, said he raised a bunch of money. I looked at the numbers you had there and it was kind of fascinating. There's another Republican in the race, uh, Wilski, and he uh, retired Navy SEAL. He raised a bunch of money. But he has spent a lot of it, and after debts, actually has less money available to spend than the other Republican running in the race, um, El Cajon Mayor Bill Wells. And so is that one of those examples of, like, if you just tout how much they raise, it might stand out a lot, but, you know, you got to keep in mind how much is available. And it seems like you would want that available a lot farther on from now than now. Yeah. I, I, exactly. You know, I think most people in our industry are are pretty shrewd to they, you know, they dig through and kind of at the end of the day add up, um, okay, they really only have this. But the problem is, you know, a lot of the, the candidates always, they always only advertise, especially in the headline, the press release, so-and-so raises X amount of dollars. 
a lot of people aren't going to read the press release. They'll see the headline. They'll see the news headlines. And that's kind of what becomes the conventional wisdom over time. So that's why you're seeing, you know, DeMaio say, oh, just raise 100, just raise 250, whatever the whatever the number is. But I think if you're if you're truly wanting to evaluate a race and evaluate, especially, again, over the long haul, what they're going to be able to do, that number is important. Especially because, you know, a lot of the donations that come in early, they're the low-hanging fruit. So if you're a candidate, it only really gets harder over time. So if you've immediately burned all your stash, you kind of back yourself into a bit of a corner. Right. Former um, chief of staff for Mayor Dick Murphy here, uh, John Kern, longtime consultant uh, of local politics. He once told me you only need, you don't need the most money in a race, you need enough money. What would uh, enough money in a congressional race like this be? Is it million? Do you need a million? Do you, uh, how does that, especially if it's contested like this, kind of open? Congressional races by themselves are chaotic. Open congressional races are more chaotic. Special election, open congressional seats are even more chaotic. And then, you know, open, maybe not open, guys on trial, maybe right. it's a seat. It's like the galaxy brain chaotic. So it it depends on a lot of factors. I would say to be to be reasonably competitive and be considered kind of a tier A candidate, I would say five hundred is probably a pretty good number. Yeah. And again, it depends on are you are you fighting a special election race where you need to do as much as possible in only any days, or is it more of a primary race where okay, we can we can stretch this out a bit more. We have a bit more time to build up our name ID. Mm-hmm. A shorter time frame, you know, might help Carl a bit more just because he's got a lot of name ID just from just being in San Diego politics for a while, being on the radio. But if there's time for other candidates to kind of catch up, raise a bit more money, build a more of a of, of a campaign that can go to the distance and, and chip away at his support, that's a different kind of arithmetic. So you you've worked in that district, you've worked in East County, you've seen you've followed the politics there. What is your take? on on that race. Carl doesn't actually live there, but he has such good name ID in so many cases. He seems like he'd be a pretty competitive candidate there. But how do you read that race? I, I, I just don't know where to even start. Like, uh, It seems like Duncan Hunter himself has a chance to be reelected. Yeah, this is my question, and I would love your take on it, because I feel like my hot take is that I don't know how endangered he actually is. I feel like Carl's whole framing, and certainly if he is forced to resign, that's a whole other animal. But if he's on the ballot, why doesn't he have a good chance? He was already indicted last time around and reelected. The tricky part is the more candidates that get into a race, the more it matters of who kind of has the biggest, most devoted base, right? Because if you have, I mean, it's kind of like looking at, you know, the Republican campaign for president in 16, there were 17 candidates. And, you know, Trump, I don't think early on, never really got above mid-20s, if I remember if I remember correctly. But Solid. Yeah, yeah. But it was solid and it was always there. Whereas if there weren't 16 other people trying to, you know, carve away at that other block, the math wouldn't have worked out necessarily in his favor. So similarly for congressional races, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, Amar, the Democrats seem to be rallied around Amar. He seems to be the guy. You figure no matter what happens, he gets into the runoff just based on the numbers. And if the Republicans end up with, you know, five, six, seven, eight candidates, the one with the biggest base in there is going to make it to the runoff. In this case, if Duncan's still on the ballot come March, he's probably the Republican choice just based on math and based on name ID and things like that. That being said, if, you know, say the 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 Hunter trial doesn't go well for Hunter and there's a seat open up and you have, you know, you have a DeMaio and you have several, several others. It kind of becomes, okay, who can build out the best coalition? You know, someone could go out there and organize the heck out of the evangelical community and build a base that way and get through into the runoff with 18, 20, 25%, something like that. How big of a, of a block is the evangelical, the people who might be still hostile to same sex marriage, and then anti-abortion folks, because that was one of the first things I was kind of surprised to see the reaction among some Repu- Republican commenters about DeMaio's entry in that race, that this seat is supposed to be kind of set aside for folks that more cater to that group. Is that true, do you think? Is that a real powerful block that would be a problem for DeMaio? Potentially. I mean, the, even, the, you know, you have the social issue factor out there. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, DeMaio ran a congressional race, you know, four years ago in a, in a district that is wildly different than the East County seat. So I'm, I imagine he took a lot of different specific policy positions, you know, whether it was on uh, health care and things like that to cater to that audience. And, you know, if it gets brought up that, hey, look here, which which Carl are we kind of getting? Yeah. You know, I think Carl's built a really good name brand for himself. I think he's definitely built himself up as a kind of a true crusader. 
But you know what's nice about being on the radio and not being in elected office is you get to pick and choose the the issues that you want to you know move forward. You know every Republican doesn't like taxes and doesn't like wasteful government and, and the things Carl's been talking about. But when it comes down to you're no longer dis, you're no longer picking the topics at the table. The other either the other candidates or the media are. It's you know it's unclear where he's going to stand on some of these issues and to the extent that his brand name is going to really help him fend off potential issues like that. Mm-hmm. Carl's entry into the race this week brought up sort of a more general question for me, which is, at what point is it going to be too late for people to jump into races? I mean, we're still waiting to see whether somebody like Mark Kersey enters the mayor's race. There's still some talk about whether Daryl Issa will also jump into the 50th district. Is there a a cutoff point? I mean, I think someone like Ice, you know, in, in, in Ice's case, he's got a lot of name ID. He's got a lot of resources. So even if, you know, he wasn't as well known, he could change that pretty quickly. I think for someone like a Kersey, it's, you know, as more and more people get on the trains of either Gloria or Bree, it gets harder to make a compelling case for yourself. So it's it's definitely dependent on the race. I've seen candidates, you know, get in right before the filing deadline and end up putting it together. Uh, if you're starting from scratch, you need to start earlier. If you're starting with a base, if you're starting with some resources, you have the luxury of starting a little bit late. And it also depends on how the other candidates and dynamics are kind of shaping out. So we saw a competitive county supervisor race in 2018, but it ended up being a, a runaway for for Nathan Fletcher. And, um, and so now we're looking at District 3, which could determine the makeup of the board, whether it's dominated by Republicans or whether it's dominated by Democrats. This is a five-member board of supervisors. And uh, so now we see two, three very competitive races, and we're starting to see how those dynamics play out as far as how much money people raise and things like that. I don't know if Nathan Fletcher's race really counts for a model. This, These three might be better models for how these races play out in the future. So now uh, District 3, we have Kristen Gaspar, the incumbent, running. She notoriously flirted with the idea of running for Congress, decided not to. And she also spent a lot of time embracing some of the anti immigrant um, movement and and President Trump's uh, own act- activities and his, and his own confrontation with the state of California. And that caused uh, her a lot of controversy. And, and now she's going to take that into this, this race. And there are two Democrats fiercely battling to oppose her in the runoff, Olga Diaz, city councilwoman in Escondido, and um, Tara Lawson-Reamer, a uh, lecturer and, and uh, nonprofit leader, and she uh, she raised more money, but they all have a relatively similar amount of money going into the into the uh, final. Um, uh, how how did you read that race? What are you following there? What uh, is Gaspar de- guaranteed? Do you think to make the final, or how do we how do we read this race? Yeah, I think Gaspar is guaranteed just based on math, right? Mm-hmm. Um, unless something completely implodes or wild happens, but I think it's pretty hard just mathematically speaking. You know, in terms of the the numbers, it kind of goes back to what you were saying. It's not, you don't need the most, you just need to be kind of in the game. I think all of them are. I know outside groups, you know, on Kristen's side, potentially the business community, the same way they you know, they came together pretty effectively in 16 when she won for the, the initial time. SEIU seems to be going all in on Tara Lawson Reamer. Uh, they've already got, you know, an IE set up as far as I know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Olga is no slouch on her own. Um, I know Nathan is very strongly behind her. I assume he's going to do everything in his power from a resource standpoint to try to try to help her. So, you know, I think it's going to be the, the primary is going to be very contentious. I think Kristen got a little bit lucky in the fact that not only are the two Democrats running, but they couldn't really reach kind of a I think they wanted to reach kind of an agreement and say, all right, let's you know, we can both run, but let's not slaughter each other or let's at least kind of maybe pick one uh, that didn't happen. So they're going to be battling it out a lot there. So she has luxury from that standpoint. And, you know, it's just remember, it's really hard to take out a incumbent supervisor. She obviously was the exception last time against Dave Roberts, but I think prior to that, it had been 30 years or something like that since a supervisor was taken out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think that showed the strength of her as a, as a candidate as well. So I think she has a difficult path, but she certainly has a path there. So that'll be, you know, a fun one to watch. Mm-hmm. One thing that's interesting to me about that district, we've seen people talk about who's raising what money and between Olga Diaz and Tara Lawson Raymer, kind of who's winning um, endorsements. How much do you think geography plays into that race? Because, you know, obviously, uh, Kristen Gaspar has a base in Encinitas. It seems like Tara Lawson Raymer has a lot of support in Encinitas as well. And then Olga Diaz is based in Escondido. Is it more advantageous to have a lot of voters in one of those areas in that particular district? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, 
you have people who run for legislature and they serve in the legislature and they represent an area forever and they think they're the most popular person in that area and then they see a poll and nobody knows who the heck they are whereas you know when you're a mayor to a certain extent when you're a supervisor when you're when you're a local elected official who when someone calls and you can walk down the street and fix their parking issue or fix whatever little nook and cranny is bugging you that's the sort of stuff that really imprints on people so you got to remember Olga's been in Escondido for 10 years now she's run several elections she's run citywide if i recall correctly mm-hmm. um, and it's the biggest single jurisdiction in the district outside of you know some I mean, maybe it's maybe the San Diego suburbs out of a bit more but it's a definitely a nice base for her to run from and running as elected official you have a record that you can that you can point to and say here's what I've actually been able to uh, accomplish so I think I think people are kind of looking at lots and Reamer's numbers and you know their eyes are lighting up a little bit but I think you know from a fundamental level Olga can be Olga can be just as strong of a candidate in that kind of democratic race Let's talk about that other race in East County. So District 2, this is another county supervisor race. The There's a Democrat, Kenya Taylor, who's running. And uh, she's uh, she spoke with her. She's got a lot of great ideas. She did come in uh, far lower on fundraising um, than the two Republicans. It's a very Republican district. There's uh, Steve Voss, mayor of Poway, and Joel Anderson, former state senator. So... Joel Anderson had flirted with running with the, for this race several years ago, famously did not, but did collect some money that he still has to deploy in this race. How is this going to break down? This seems fascinating as far as a Republican sort of battle. How how do people how are people going to make decisions and what kind of issues are really going to find them? So it seems like Voss has a lot of the institutional support, Mayor Kevin Faulkner, Diane Jacob, the incumbent in that seat, a bunch of people like that. But Anderson's got money, and and he is pretty well known in the district. Uh, how do you how do you see that race? So yeah, as you alluded to, Voss kind of from the gate picked up a lot of support initially, whether it was the Lincoln Club, other business groups. I know we got the Deputy Sheriff's Association. So he's been kind of running kind of exactly the campaign you want to be running the first seven months out the gate or however long it's been. Fundraising wise too, you know, I think he's two forty right off the bat, which again for someone who hasn't run beyond Poway before uh, is a pretty impressive right off, you know, coming coming from zero. In addition, you have the Diane Jacobs factor. She has, I think, half a million, and she's made it very clear that she plans to participate in that race. Yeah, Voss emailed us after the politics report and said, I wish you would have mentioned the half million dollars that Diane Jacob has to spend on this race. She supports me, you know, wink, wink. Like, So she's made it known she's going to deploy that. Yes. And she does not like Joel Anderson. That's correct. He, Yeah, they have a history together. So that all being said, though, you know, Anderson has been more of a institution in East County. He's been there since 2006. Again, keep in mind what I said about running for legislature, but I'd say he's probably in the top five percentile in terms of harder working politicians that I've witnessed uh, directly, both on the campaign trail, but also um, within the legislative standpoint. And I've seen him pull a lot of tricks out of his back pocket and surprise a lot of people. So I think Voss certainly has the advantage from a lot of different factors. But I think, you know, it's you never want to write off Anderson necessarily. I also think Anderson's last couple of years haven't been great from a negative PR standpoint. Yeah, PR standpoint. <laughs> and I assume, you know, Diane is aware of that as well. That strikes me as a race that could get ugly very quickly because Steve Voss and Joel Anderson are both just such big personalities. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you said, there is ammo out there. There's a lot of tensions. And I think that it could get negative pretty quick. Anderson himself has a particular DeMaio kind of Trump-esque way of of capitalizing on messaging, you know, of of framing divisive issues well. I mean, he jumped uh, on a lot of the immigration issues, sanctuary city issues, but he also... um, he also has a way of like really being good with the press too. He's willing to talk, yeah, and absolutely. so he can he can generate. Boss is no slouch there either. Exactly. So it could be a real. I um, just can see them both being like out there talking all the time yeah. and like really going after each other. Yeah. So that'll be fun to watch. Yeah. All right, County District One. This is South Bay. You mentioned Rafael Castellano, support commissioners raised a, a lot of money. Has a lot on hand. I actually, just to illustrate how sensitive people are about these discussions, I said he has the most resources to deploy for now. And people were like really mad at me that I said for now, like that was itself like a indictment of him or that. So I just literally just <laughs> said it for some reason. So I meant nothing about it, but. He's a very strong candidate going in there, but 
South Bay has its own alliances and 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 rivalries uh, a lot. Is is Weso? Are we just waiting for him to kind of explode? Do you think, or uh, how is this going to play out? In the same way that District Three, everyone seems to be wanting to take a side, especially on the Democratic side. It's kind of the complete opposite in District One, where everyone's kind of sitting on the sidelines. You know, the labor groups haven't weighed in to any extent that I've noticed. There really haven't. There's been a few elected officials taking sides, but nothing super overwhelming or impressive. And you know, it seems. I don't know if the Democratic Party is going to necessarily make an endorsement in that race either, um, just because it's you know you got three candidates who are all equally strong. It's hard to necessarily cobble together the the votes that you need to do that. So. You know, we're kind of in this weird holding pattern here. I think I think Wayso, just based on his name ID, can probably assume he's going to be in the runoff. And so the race is really for who gets that second slot right now. It's ossified right now. And so it's kind of in a situation where everyone's just waiting for something to happen. So, you know, if one, even a group that's not even that big or influential, if they, you know, kick a candidate forward, it could kind of shake up the race a little bit. Because again, you know, Raphael certainly has the the money and he looks good there. I would say he's probably just based on name ID and the, the dynam- dynamics in that race, probably behind Nora and um, Wayso at this point in time. You know, Nora has the benefit of being the only female in that race, or at least major female. And then, you know, if a Republican get, gets in, ends up getting in that race, that might scramble the math a lot more yeah, there was mention of Dave, David Bejarano running, perhaps. Mm-hmm. He was a uh, Chula Vista police chief. Um, but has, have there been others that have come up as names? Uh, not that I've... Oh, I've, I've heard there's a Coronado school board member who might right. be looking at it. But other than that, not really. And it's not that it's a seat Republicans can necessarily take just based on the demographics. But you know, if you have a Republican in the race, the people who might be more conservative, but may not as partisan, who might vote for someone like a Raphael, they have a place where they can land and feel a bit more comfortable out there. Yeah, that race right. district does stretch into Coronado. So there are there are are more conservative voters there. I think that name ID point that you made is important, though, because if you remember back to 2016, Rafael Castellanos was in many ways considered the front runner to be the next city attorney because he, too, had raised money and he garnered a lot of support. And, you know, nobody really gave Mara Elliott a shot in that. But, you know, her name and the title she had on the ballot turned out to be really crucial. And I think that could maybe be a similar factor here. Yeah, I think, you know, you know city city attorney, nobody knows what the heck that does really and so the ballot title there was especially strong and, you know it, if if Raphael's able to keep raising the money to the extent he he can he might be able to you know candidates not only have to they have to make sure they get their name out for themselves a lot of times they don't have resources to go negative as well whereas if he has enough he can both make sure he checks the box of hey here's who i am and then also you know do some negatives on one of the other candidates depending on their strategic yeah he definitely learned from that race yeah and it is an open seat so he's not running against an incumbent right but you know somebody like ben Wayso is kind of a quasi incumbent exactly extent, yeah. right well we are going to be following all these races uh intensely over the next several months so pay attention this was uh we'll check back obviously in the next several months to see how they've played out uh we don't necessarily like to cover horse races as much as as uh this is this is how this comes together the endorsements the money that is how the um uh, the races shape up and so it's worth understanding uh so we can go through that so thank you mason for helping us do that my pleasure uh, we'll talk to you again soon sounds good Thanks for listening to the Voice of San Diego podcast. You can keep up with everything we're doing with our newsletters. We have a lot of them. Get the morning report every morning. Andy and I put together the politics report every Saturday, and Sarah wraps it up with what we learned this week. That comes out every Sunday. Get all those at voiceofsandiego.org slash newsletters. I'm Scott Lewis, the CEO and editor-in-chief. Andrew Keats is the assistant editor at Voice of San Diego, and Sarah Libby is the managing editor. This show was produced by Nate John, Adriana Heldes, and Megan Wood. We'll talk to you next week.